Hey everybody, it's Luke Humphrey with the Luke Humphrey Running Podcast. And uh, today we're going to jump into the second part of our marathon long run section. So hopefully uh, we'll expand upon the uh, conversation we had a couple weeks ago uh, with really kind of covering the foundation of of long runs in general and starting to get into those marathon specific type of long runs. So um, so I just want to jump into that and, uh, you know, I'm recording this uh the 10th of April, so Boston is coming up, and I just wanted to wish everybody running Boston the best of luck, and hopefully uh, it stays dry and the wind's at your back. Um, I will be out, uh, I'll be out there Saturday through the race, coming back, come back home Monday afternoon, uh, so uh, be out there cheering for you guys, and then like uh, we talked about before, if you guys are around, you want to do a shakeout run with us. We will be at the uh, Lynch Chocolate Factory. It's uh, two blocks uh, up from the up from the finish line. We're going to do that Sunday morning at 8 o'clock. Uh, we'll just meet and do like a 30-minute shakeout run, uh, do some last-minute talk about uh, where we're at with the weather and all that good stuff, and uh, um, and then take some group photos and stuff. It's always a good time to meet a lot of the people that I, I know names. I see names come across from Final Surge or in our Facebook group, but, uh, never actually get to meet you. So it's a great time to, uh, actually get to meet some of you guys too. So, uh, with that, let's just jump right in. I think, uh, I think last time we, we, you know, we really talked about just building general endurance and we talked a little bit about fasted runs and fueled runs and things like that, but we didn't really get into more of like how you would actually manipulate the run itself. So, um, you know, so last time we talked about long runs that were that were more simple, but not really any less easy. Uh, this this one we're going to expand on the on more of the specific endurance type of things, other than just the the general endurance. Um, I'll take it. I'll discuss a few instances where I I don't think uh, um, we would change like as far as the makeup of the timing and things like that. But uh, but all these long runs should occur during a time after you've done general training. So I, I, these runs I wouldn't put really put in the beginning of your training cycle. I'd put these more um, in that last, you know, six to eight weeks for some people, 10 weeks, depending on how long their cycle is. But uh, really these are marathon specifics. So you really want to build your general long run up first and then kind of gravitate into something like this. So with that, let's, uh, let's jump right in. The first one is the fast finish long run. Um, I think, Anybody who has been um, following us for any length of time know we've talked about this quite a few quite a few times. Um, and this was my first introduction into really the you know air quotes next level training. Uh, I don't rec- quite recall who started, but my first experience really was uh, from Khalid Kanuchi. Uh, he was a Moroccan marathoner, and then he later became a U.S. citizen, um, kind of towards the end of his career. Uh, he was always a favorite at the Chicago Marathon. I think he broke the world record at Chicago Marathon in in '99. Um, but he'd, he's always—I mean, super friendly guy. Um, always talked to us. You know, had quite a few conversations. Always said hello, um, things like that. But he was really known for like actually. It's been a long time since I had, I had really um, thought about what Khalid brought to the table for us, and so I kind of YouTubed. Uh, some of his races and, and, you know, like the guy would literally run, you know, this was, this is a time when 206, I think 205, 206 was still the world record. So, so slow. Right. But, uh, um, you know, that was really the uncharted territory at the time. And, and Khalid would just, he would let guys go and, and then just be able to drop the hammer for, for not even, not a mile or two miles, but like he could literally run, 14 flat at the end of a marathon so that's i mean that's essentially 430 mile pace at the end of a marathon it was just I- incredible to watch and you know i remember one time where chicago marathon you sh- used to actually kind of go underneath mccormick place where the expo is and, and then come back out and finish where it does and now it takes a little bit different route that last couple miles but um that was kind of always his mark right and that'd be with about two miles to go and I remember a time where he literally dropped like he would he dropped like an 845 last two miles to to win the marathon. It was just amazing. And he but his, that was his staple. Like he would do long runs and just do the last two miles essentially 
racing as hard as he could, you know. So that was really our our first intro to it. And so, you know, guys like Clint Varon and, and Brian Sell were like, hey, Kevin and Keith, we really got to try this. And, you know, they, they let us, you know, they kind of, we kind of just kind of um, – eased ourselves into it and kind of we didn't really know exact the exacts of what Cleed was doing so we just kind of made it up as we went but um so we tried it you know and so we always had uh, a sunday run sunday group run with the stony creek running club it was something like the hansen's running shops and stony creek running club the kind of partnership but it always rotated sites but way back in the day it's a little different now but uh it rotated sites and so one of the sites was uh this middle school kind of way out in northern oakland county which is uh, a ton of dirt roads pretty hilly um, you know, like people say, oh, you're from Detroit. You don't have any place to train. Actually, you know, you go north, northern Oakland County and it's, it's pretty amazing running out there. So, but, uh, it was a tough loop, tons of dirt roads, hills, and then they had a track actually behind the middle school. Um, so being where we were as a team, we were pretty competitive as a team. So we'd hit the long run pretty hard. Um, you know, pretty close to, we probably averaged pretty close to six minute pace or maybe a little under for the long run. And then we would run. Uh, well, we'd kind of get our we'd get our flats, or we'd leave them by the track, and then uh, we'd go out to the track. And later on, we kind of realized this is where we're kind of screwing up. But uh, we we basically did 18 miles, and then we'd go put our flats on, and then go to the track, and basically line up and race two miles. Um, and it was hard. It was really hard. It was a real. It was a really big gut check, but it was kind of fun too, because part of it was, you know, just seeing what you could do. Right. It was the 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 exhilaration of the unknown right and not knowing what was going to happen it was really kind of fun kind of scary and really hurt uh but it was it was definitely you know and then it kind of gave you this confidence that oh my gosh i could i could i can do this you know um and it was hard but like i said it was hard so obviously what but uh it's something that we i don't know we wouldn't do it all the time i don't i don't remember doing this run more than one or two times during a during a marathon segment and this was a time when i mean our marathon our marathon segments were probably 14 weeks and so we'd really like our segments would look more you know kind of how i set some of the plans up on final surge where you know i'm a we, we were training hard all year round so it's not like we needed to have a build up and then jump in and do the marathon segment so it wasn't like we needed a 16 18 20 week segment because we were our mileage was already pretty high we were probably just coming off of a speed segment already so we didn't need to really repeat that section of it right we could just do uh, marathon stuff so we'd kind of you know do our speed segment take a little bit of downtime a few weeks of easy running and kind of gradually you know, like marathon pace workouts and then really like the last 10 10 weeks would be really marathon specific our highest volume all that good stuff um so but it was so i don't, re- I don't really remember doing this more than once or twice during a segment um and, and it would fit into the time frame that we we talked about uh, the, going back to what, what we did though, I mean, we definitely made mistakes. And the first one was changing into our racing flats. I remember Kevin got pretty, pretty ticked at us about that and was like, "That's not the point of the run." And so uh, we actually kind of evolved from that. And so then I, I only remember doing it on track once or twice. And then you know Kevin kind of like took the reins on it. And so we would essentially do it where um, we would do a pretty hard long run, but we'd always end somewhere on the paint creek trail which is from rochester to lake orion um which is right around it's actually pretty close to where that middle school is but uh we would we would end it so that where the hard section would be um a couple mile stretch would basically be halfway between lake orion and rochester and we'd go all the way to basically tinkin road because tinkin road's a pretty busy road and you can't really cross it without having to stop um so we'd basically have it so where the two to three miles would be to Tinkin Road, and then you basically get stuck at Tinkin Road and cool down the last mile back to the uh, the Duck Pond where we always met. Um, so it kind of evolved to that over time, and so then obviously, and it wasn't one of those things where we stopped and put flats on. We just ran it in our in our shoes that we did the long run, and so I mean and that was a long time ago. So the really the lightweight trainers weren't really big. The minimalist wasn't necessarily even around at that point. Um, you know, I'm thinking like it was basically doing that in adrenalines or what would be the equivalent of the Brooks launch or something like that now. So it wasn't like we were in super light shoes and then, uh, but we were ripping. I mean, we were, you know, I, most of the time we were under five minute pace, um, 
when we were younger. Now, now it, I don't think the last time I did it, I was under five minute pace, but uh, it would be pretty quick. And it would actually be more than marathon pace. Uh, it would be, it would basically be as hard as you could um, and stay under control, right? So it wouldn't be like you'd go out and run 440 and then fade to a 510 or something like that. You'd really want it to be so something where it'd be like 450, 445, or 455, 450, something that would you could, you'd be hard, it'd be really hard, but you could pick it up the second mile too. And we never did this more than for two or three miles. I think three miles is about the farthest we ever, ever went with that. But again, it wasn't like we ran a super easy long run up to that point. The long run leading into it was pretty quick. It was definitely like what I would consider in your moderate to long run pace for the vast majority of that long run. And then you kind of just gradually picked it right up into into marathon pace. So even like the mile before, say marathon pace for us was 510, you know, the mile before might be like 530, the mile before might be like 540, 45. So it was a gradual pick up to that point and then let it rip for two to three miles and then cool down the, the last mile. So, um, but that's how, that's how we did the fast finish long run. And that worked out really well for a lot of us. Um, so some of the points I have on here for you guys is you know you definitely want to do this last six to eight weeks of a marathon segment maybe out to ten um, depending on your ability level but I think that last six to eight weeks is pretty key for most people um, I definitely want to do it successive weeks I think you follow one tough long, long run with an easier long run the following week I don't think you need to do a lot of these during that time I think one to three is is plenty during a marathon segment and then really focus on the recovery aspect after these I think pushing yourself to that limit on already fatigued legs will require extra attention from the recovery department. And then from my experience, just getting down to marathon, ta- marathon pace is tough enough for most people that I've given this run to. I don't think it's any harder for those who are like chasing bar- Boston qualifiers or new time thresholds to get faster than that. This is going to teach you how to push through late in the game, even when you're, when you're tired. And that's really the major component of this long run is, is teaching your muscles to to maintain a hard effort when you're already tired and you already have a bunch of miles on your legs and really drawing from those I think physiologically what you do too is you you kind of start drawing into those other muscle fibers so you've basically exhausted the fast twitch or made them so tired that they're relying on intermediate fibers and maybe even fast twitch fibers to get involved in the in the action and so that's really what's the nice thing about this is that so then once you do get into the marathon you do have that ability to draw from those other muscle fibers that would just normally be be dormant because they're not utilized that much during training. So uh, I think that's a big a big component to that. I think it's a confidence boost too, knowing that you can run for that long long a time, be tired, and still hit marathon pace. I think that's a big big confidence boost. All right. So oh, and the other thing I guess I guess I would say I don't have this on my notes, but I guess the other thing I would say on that on the uh, um, and the fast finish is, so there's a couple ways to do that. Like if you are, so say you found like the advanced plan, you have a 16 mile long run one week. And then the next week you have, I think it's a 12 or a 14 mile long run. So if you're in a position where you're not really sure of what you should do, you could always do like the 16 mile long run as scheduled. And then the shorter long run where you do the fast finish, because it's not quite as long, so you can maybe pick it up a little bit those last couple of miles. I've done that before, um, but I would be careful with this because if you're already really fatigued into that into that part of the training, I wouldn't do a 16 miler and then hammer the heck out of a 14 miler. That 14 miler is really in there kind of to get somewhat of a long run in, but also get a little bit recovery because we're not going the full 16 mile distance too. So you have to kind of play it. You have to know, you have to know where your body's at, right? You know, and I think sometimes people get caught up in just doing a lot of extra stuff, but then kind of negating how their body's reacting to the training. So if you're getting really stale and you think you might be on the verge of going beyond cumulative fatigue into overtraining, I don't necessarily think I would, I would do that. I would maybe just make the 16 mile your, your fast finish. And then the next week in a 12 or 14 mile, Use that really as a recovery type of medium long run type of situation. Okay. All right. So Squires long runs. Uh, Squires long run comes from Coach Squires of the Boston Track Club. And this is from the uh, Bill Rogers and Greg Meyer era. Uh, The long run was a great way to accumulate time at marathon pace for the week, but also bring the average pace of your long runs down. So to me, uh, and to me, it was a great, it's a great tool to learn how marathon pace feels throughout the course of time. So when you first start these marathon 
um, pickups or fart licks types of things that we'll talk about in a second, you feel pretty comfortable, right? You're, you're going to marathon pace feels pretty comfortable by the last couple. It's pretty tough, right? So you kind of, you kind of learn how that pace and that effort feels over the course of time. So that, that effort is one thing when you're fresh, it's another when you're, when you're tired and that learning that over the course of the same run is, is a big, is a big dividend to pay you back, um, on your training. So, um, I also think it is a great long run for those who struggle with the traditional marathon tempos. Like, you know, I have had people where they're just like, I cannot do uh, a 10 mile tempo. Like it just, I'm, I'm all over the place with it. And so this, this is actually a good way to, um, kind of build some confidence on that. Even though if you, I still would want you to do the tempo runs, uh, over the course of the cycle, but this is a good kind of, way to mix things up and give yourself a little bit more confidence and break it up from a traditional monotony of a, of a, of a long tempo run, but still accumulate a bunch of time of the, at the, at your goal marathon pace. So, um, but if you aren't familiar with these, these are essentially long runs with a fart lick in the middle to second half of the long run. So really you kind of start like towards, you know, maybe 40 to 50% into your long run. And then you go through like three quarters to 85, 90% of the long run and then the last little bits of cool down. So I think you can actually start these earlier in a training cycle. So say eight to 10 weeks out from marathon, if you're a more seasoned marathon veteran, use these first mile, use the first miles as a warm up. progress into the moderate paces before starting into the marathon pace uh, fart legs. So I would say if you have a 16 mile long run, maybe use the first six miles of that as a warm up into, into a progression into the moderate and long run pace. And then, then you can go into the fart lick. So um, I'd say start with small amounts of time, say eight times, two to three minutes at marathon pace, and then jog between each hard effort, two to three minutes. So it's two to three minutes on, two to three minutes off. And then each long run, you, each long run you do up the time. So if you do this three to four times throughout a training cycle, then you could be able to maybe get up for 10 times, seven to eight minutes at marathon pace. And ideally the recovery would stay the same at about roughly three minutes. So you're putting more time in at marathon pace, reducing the recovery time between each, um, but you're still kind of breaking it up. And even if like, if you look at it from a heart rate standpoint or something like that, you know, your heart rate's really not given enough time to come way down. It's still going to be fairly high when you, when you're during the recovery and then jump back up to where it would be for the marathon. So you're still going to learn you know, so from a physiological standpoint, your body's not going to know much difference between a continual run in a smaller, um, you know, smaller blocks, but with really the small breaks in between. And so you're really going to accumulate the same effort, even though you're approaching it a lot differently. So um, I really like these from that aspect. Uh, recovery uh, from each marathon pace from each, I'm sorry. Recovery between each marathon pace effort is still your easy to moderate pace. So it's not like you slow way, way down on these. I still want you to keep a fairly good clip going while you're while you're doing the recovery. And then time it out so that you have the last couple miles of your run as a cool down. Um, the first time you do it, obviously, there might be some trial and error. But as you get more comfortable with these, you should be able to space these out appropriate, appropriately. Um, and this is a run where you want to be fueling for, allowing yourself to keep that effort high is going to be key in providing that fuel um, to do so is going to be uh, necessary for, for that intensity. And then again, post-run recovery is as important during, uh, as the post-run recovery is as important as the effort given during the run. So this is actually going to be, you know, this is a run where you don't want to be like, okay, well, you know, I'll go home and maybe in an hour or so I'll, I'll get something to eat. No, you got to start the recovery process ASAP. Because again, we talk about recovery all the time, but if you've depleted yourself and even though you've taken fuel during the run, you've still depleted yourself quite a bit. So giving yourself the giving your, giving your body the fuel it needs to recover is what's going to allow you to come back stronger and make those adaptations that you just put your body through as far as a, a damage standpoint and a physiological standpoint. Um, having the fuel to recover from that is actually going to allow those adaptations to go through. So make sure you're staying on that. All right, the third one is the combo. And if you're in our Facebook group, I've offered this one up for a long time. Uh, if you are really, if, you, if you're really tight on time in a particular week, and that's what I get a lot. Like if I have to, okay, would you rather play a game? Or would you rather, would you rather do your tempo run or your strength run? 
And so I, what I'll say is, why don't you get the com- why don't you do the combo and do your tempo run during your long run? It's a it's a great compromise. And if you have done the 10 mile tempo, then this is really nothing new, right? The mileage is nothing new. You've done that. Um, now we're just basically saying it's a combination of a long run and a tempo run. Um, you've probably done this plenty of Thursdays already. So uh, what I would say is you use the first miles as a warm up. And the only the biggest difference is for a lot of people, and I don't think it is for quite a few of you, because I think a lot of you during the week, you basically just do your warm up and go straight from your warm up into your um, tempo run and then straight into your cool down. Where I would prefer you do a warm up, do dynamic stretches, do the drills, get you ready to jump right into marathon pace, do your marathon pace, you know, cool down, maybe do some other other stretching and stuff in between. But, you know, so to me, those are th- to, to me, I view the tempo is three separate runs. It's a warm up, cool down or warm up tempo and cool down. Whereas I think most of you just do it as a straight run anyway, um, which is fine. I, you know, there's not a ton of, I'm not going to put up a big fight on that. Um, so in this sense, yeah, you have, but if you, if you are one of those people who like, you know, warms up, changes in the racing flats, does your tempo, you know, now you've just combined this as one run. So you've just one big block of time at a running effort. So, um, so again, warm up the first few miles, gradually increase from easy to moderate to long run pace. So like maybe if you do three mile warm up, it's like easy, moderate, long run pace those first three miles, and then you jump right into marathon pace. So each each mile is basically a bridge to the next level of your of pace zone. And then do your assigned tempo run at your goal marathon pace. Ideally, this is done for longer tempos, say the eight to 10 milers. I think that's where this is the best fit. Um, set up so that the last one to three miles can be used as a cool down. And so that might mean, you know, uh, you do a four or five mile warm up and then do your tempo and then cool down one mile. To me, I don't particularly care. I don't think that's a big deal. Um, plus it gives you a little bit more time to kind of ease into the ease into getting closer and closer to marathon pace before actually starting into marathon pace. Um, this should also be a fueled run. I think this is a perfect time to practice fueling at marathon pace, um, for an extended effort of time. Um, and you're going to have to go to the well pretty deep on these. So don't dig it so deep that you cannot get out. So fueling during these is crucial. Same thing with post run recovery. Again, I can't stress that enough. Get on your refueling, rehydration, and hopefully rest as soon as you possibly can. And if you do this on the weekend, you are typically doing in place of a tempo run during the week. So you may need to adjust the days before and after. So um, ideally in a perfect world, what I would say is, you know, you get, you still get like an eight to 10 mile run in on, on Thursday. So it's a little bit longer than what you're used to doing maybe. And then you go Friday, Saturday, easy, and then longer on Sunday, or you could even do the longer on Saturday, give yourself Sunday and Monday to recover before jumping into your next speed or strength workout on Tuesday. So there's definitely ways to get around that. Um, then the next one we have is the mega long run. So I know many of you thought I would never address this. I would just avoid it like the plague. Um, and I'll tell you, it's not making me comfortable. It makes me squirm in my seat. Uh, but I'm, I'm just kidding. Um, but I think, I do think we have to address it, right? I think, uh, cause like, like everything in life, there's no, there's always exceptions to the rules. There's always outliers and there's always a different point of view, right? So, um, so I want to talk about it and this is for all of you 40 mile a week runners who love your 20 milers. And of course I am just kidding. Don't give me any hate mail. I'm just picking on and teasing. So, um, uh, I, th- I do think this is an important long run type to discuss. So admittedly, so just give you clear present, you know, I've, I've never actually given a mega long run to an athlete. I've never given one. I don't personally, uh, adhere to the philosophy, but I would like to, to talk about it. All right. So, um, and I don't have any personal experience with this type of long run. So my longest long run I ever did before a marathon was about 25 miles. And that was at best, you know, I, I always joke because people say, Oh, I know you scheduled me for 16, but I actually, I got lost and it happened to be 20 miles. Exactly. And I, I, yeah, right guys. Well, anyway, (laughs) but I truly did. I truly did get lost. And, um, cause trust me, I was pretty hangry by the end of it. So it was supposed to be something like an 18 or 20 miler and it got completely messed up and it ended up being closer to 25. But, uh, 
Um, but from a from a mileage watt, from a mileage standpoint and a time standpoint, it wasn't really a mega long run. It was still under twenty five percent of my week, and from a time wise, it was still only like two hours and forty minutes. So it wasn't like I was out there for four hours running uh, a twenty five mile or anything like that. So um, so so technically, from from what seems to be the definition of a mega long run, um, I was not in that classification. Um, based on where I was at with my training. But the mega long run can mean a couple things. So it can be described in terms of mileage or in terms of time run. So when people talk to me about it, they usually express it in terms of mileage. So usually they want to do something like a 20 to 24 mile long run. And so if someone does a 22 mile long run and using the classic advanced plan, this is about 40% of your weekly mileage during the last eight to 10 weeks of the training plan. So following the plan, the longest if you are following the, the plan, the longest long run, a 16 mile would be about 29% during the same week. So you can see there's a pretty significant difference in length of, uh, of that run per weekly volume. And then secondly, sometimes mega long runs are described in terms of time. So for instance, I was reading an article from Coach uh, McMillan, Greg McMillan, and he says that he'll prescribe a long run up to 30 to 45 minutes longer than what the person is planning on running for the marathon. So if a person is trying to run a four-hour marathon, then he may give them a long run up to 445. So that doesn't mean you're going to cover something like 30 miles because you're obviously you're going to be running slower than your goal pace for the most part. Um, so they'll just be putting in a ton of time over what they plan on racing for. And so do I agree with the mega long run? You know, it depends, right? So I, I think that if you are new to the HMM, Hans's Marathon Method style of training, then no, I am really reluctant to give the green light on, on anything like that because I have just experienced too many people putting it in their own, like say, you know, getting a plan and then just saying, well, you know, I really need that 22 miler. And so they'll do the plan and then add the 22 miler and they'll do it a couple times during the segment. And then they, they don't, it doesn't work out well for them. So um, it just, they get, I think, cause the training for most people, so like they see, you know, like a Hell Higdon style where there's no 10 mile tempo runs, mileage is lower. And, but they still see those 20 mile long runs. And so they think, okay, well, uh, this isn't much more than that. In reality, you know, if you go from four or five days a week up to six days a week running, you're adding 10 to 15 more miles a week. That's a significant increase in your training, right? So if you've never done that before, I'm really reluctant because we've already changed so much and we've already added so much over the course of the week that I think adding a big long run on the end of the week, on the end of the week, simply just... It makes it too hard to get what you need to get in for the week and then do the mega long run and then recover and then keep continuing on with training. There's so much that has to change with what, how much you recover, how much you rest before and then how much you have to recover after. So to me, it's a very, very tough, tough sell. Now, uh, I do remember a few times where I've, I've spoken and people have come up to me and said, yeah, you know. I really, you know, I'm running 60 miles a week. I've done your site. I've done an HMM cycle a couple times now, you know, and I recover well from it. I handle it really well. What do you think about doing like a 22 mile run? And then you, you talk to them a little bit more and the time's not crazy. You know, it's still not, you know, it's, it's like a three and a half hour long run, you know, go ahead and try, you know, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to sit there and say it's not going to work. Right. So, um, I think, you know, you can, can go ahead. I think go ahead and try it just be careful. You have to really listen to what your body is is telling you so um the big thing is though i don't want people to scale back before and after that big long run so you have to be you have to take it easy like so you have to make sure you're fueled you have to make sure you recovered well after your tempo run and then you make sure you have to get right on your recovery afterwards so that you can recover for what you're going to be doing on Tuesday. So there's a lot of things you have to factor in. I don't want you to scale back what you do the three day, three or four days before and three or four days after. I wanted to just be jumping right into the continual cycle, like tempo, couple easy days, long run, easy day, workout, off day, tempo run. You know, I don't want that cycle to necessarily change. Um, so you have to be really careful with that. So don't, again, just don't dig the well so deep that you that you have to get out to. I mean, ideally it would be nice to go out for a, you know, if you're planning and run three and a half hours from the marathon, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I don't, I, it would be nice to say, okay, I can go out there and run for three and a half hours. But, uh, but you, you know, and this isn't meant as a knock on people at all, but I think if you're in that 
four, four and a half, five hour range, I just don't think it makes sense from a practical standpoint. So, um, so when I'm referring to mega long run by time, I think you have to look at it from a different point of view. So if you're, if you're following the plans and you're running long runs at say 10 minutes per mile or slower, then a 16 mile long run is already taking you two and three quarters hours at the least, right? So for a lot of you, it's probably gonna be closer to three hours. And what I think makes that work is the idea of the day before. So you're putting a significant easy run of eight miles or at least another hour and 20 minutes. So in the last 24 hours, most of these runners are putting in roughly four hours of running. That's a ton of running, right? That's a significant amount. And that's gonna stimulate all the adaptations that you needed that would also have been provided by the mega long run, but it kind of spaces it out so where that you can actually recover in a, in a reasonable time frame. And so the other aspect I want you to look at is from really a practical standpoint. So using the examples above, a four and a half hour marathon, which is about 10, 15 a mile, would in theory be able to run a five hour, 15 minute long run. Uh, and, you know, and I'm just looking at that from a time standpoint, and it seems completely brutal to me. I, I personally feel like that would cause more harm than good. Um, this is because we deplete ourselves so much to begin with and we break down during the long run. The long run is a workout, right? And we're breaking muscle tissue down. If we're out there for, you know, half of the daylight hours, man, that's just, that's a ton of damage that we're doing to ourselves. So do we, we really do dig a hole that we really probably can't get, get out of. It's going to take, you know, several days of just nothing or very easy running to get back to where you're actually even able to train again. Right. And so that's to me is not worth it because we're sacrificing an entire week to 10 days for one run that we can accomplish 95% of the same stuff anyway if we just space that out a little bit with the Saturday and Sunday setup that we have. You know, I just don't think that, I don't think we necessarily need that. Um, and I get the mental aspect of it, but to me, I feel like you have to take solace from the 10 mile tempos and the whole body of work that you're doing. So to me, a long run is just a long run, right? It doesn't, all it tells me is that I can run that set of mileage at a, at a slow pace, right? So you have to really, you know, you really have to try to look at the big, big picture of the entire training that you're doing. Uh, now, however, I think the, I think, I just think that the risk got far outweighs the, the reward for run over four hours. Um, but where I do see this working is for people running three hours and faster, right? So, so going for a three to three and a half hour long run, will help these runners, but it's not going to dig a hole so deep that they can't get out of. Um, it's still within our, it's still technically within long run standards when we look at it from a, from a time standpoint, um, from a percentage standpoint, it's probably going to be a little high, but not crazy. It's, it might be like 35% of their weekly volume, which is, I mean, it's above, but it's, you know, it's not overkill, right? So it's not like 50% of our weekly volume coming from that one day. Um, so essentially they're, they're going to dig themselves a little bit of a hole, but they're going to, if they, if they recover properly and they fuel during the run and do all those detail work, they're going to be able to recover from it. And I think that at that point, it, it's probably okay. Um, as far as when I would do that, I don't think you need to do a ton of these again, like one to two. Um, so I think when you look at that, there's a lot of different things you can do and I really leave it up to you how you want to set that up. I mean, I think the the main rule is you don't do two of those types of runs back to back. So if you do a fast finish one week, the next week's a, a kind of, you know, a recovery long run, if you will. Then the next week, maybe you jump into like a mega long run and then you come back to a shorter, you know, traditional long run. Then you go into maybe like a fartlek style. You know, there's lots of ways you can approach it. So, But you could basically do... You know, if you say eight weeks, eight weeks of training that I have dedicated to the to the marathon, then um, then I would say, you know, you could essentially get four of these, you know, extra credit type of long runs in um, during during that. And you might use you might say I might just stick with the fartlek style and see how much time I can accumulate each time I do it. How much more can I get every week? Something to that standpoint. Or you might say. I want to see if I can go from two miles down to three miles fast finish um, and see where I goes. But the other, the only other thing I would say, I guess, is that the last long run you would do, you want it to be a, a regular long run. So like if I give a long run two weeks out before their marathon, that's usually going to be a shorter and easier long run. It's not going to be anything that's this, this training, right? It's going to be just more about time on your feet, in anything. And if anything, it could be a depletion long run and then start your uh, taper process right after that. But, you know, do one last short 
kind of depleted long run and then and then start into um, building those building those stores again so making sure that you're hitting the recovery and giving your body the fuel it needs to uh, to bounce back so um, so that's a lot of stuff going on right that's a lot of long runs for the marathon um, it gives you a lot of variation I mean what we talked about in theory could give you enough variation for a, a number of cycles to come up but it also gives you benchmarks to test yourself if you want to use one long run um, at a certain time every segment it kind of gives you a, uh, a benchmark to see where you're at um, I can't stress enough that you have to take a serious look at your own ability and where you are at. It's nice to get some ideas, but you also have to be careful not to get yourself into a position um, that you can't recover from later um, in the harder in the harder stuff. Because the last thing you want to do is be have a pretty good segment going and then overkill it on the long runs and then be in a position where the last three weeks are miserable and, you, and you're overtrained now. So you have to really pay attention to how you're feeling how you're recovering. So if that long run goes great, but then your next two workouts are really bad, then maybe those long runs aren't working, right? Maybe we, maybe you try a different one or you really say, okay, I really got to get serious about focusing on um, recovery that day, the next day, the next day, whatever the case is. Or you say, hey, this probably might be a little too much. I scale it back and stick to more of the traditional type of long runs that we talked about. Um, okay, so if you're attempting these types of long runs, uh, put a put a lot of focus on fueling and recovery. I also suggest that you follow each of these long runs with a more traditional long run, not that not the next day, but the next week. And then adding too much intensity and duration for too long isn't productive either because we just get stale. We start to get overtrained. We dig again. We dig that hole so deep that we never get back to even baseline. And then if you do survive, the taper basically brings you back to baseline. It doesn't take you up to where your new fitness level truly is. So you have to be really really careful on that. Um, keep the balance of easy to hard and train hard, but recovery, recover too. And I would say this extends even to easy runs the next couple of days, right? So if you do your long run on Sunday, that Monday is really important to one, continue with the recovery process, but not worry about what that easy run pace is. If it's 30 seconds slower a mile than what you're used to, it doesn't matter. Just get, the, just let your body dictate where that pace should be. Don't get caught up in numbers. Um, and just make sure that you are recovered as much as you possibly can um, before going into the next the next workout that you have. So, all right, guys. So I think that helps you uh, see what kind of options you have out there. Uh, play around with it. Um, you know, write it out on paper. See how it looks. See what looks good to you. See what see what might be doable for you. Um, and then just take it from there. You know, and shake things up a little bit. But uh, hopefully, you guys got some ideas from this and. Uh, uh, if you want, if you don't want to do the work yourself, we have obviously have our training plans on Final Surge, um, finalsurge.com, go to training plans, and then we're the first ones there, uh, Luke Humphrey running, tons of options that literally have um, probably over 50 marathon plans, and then working on, I'm actually working on metric plans, guys, I'm working on putting the workout library together, and then I can put the schedules together based on what I have in the Imperial system, so stay on the lookout for that too. Um, but, uh, but as always, thanks you guys for listening. Thanks for your support. Also, you know, good luck to those running Boston. Uh, for those, if you want coaching or anything like that, just go to lukecomfortrunning.com, see what your options are there. Be happy to help you out any way that we can. All right. That's it for this week. And I will talk to you later.